Listen, thank you for tuning in. Welcome to Hope City. We're so glad that you're hanging out with us this very weekend. Before we do anything else, I want to honor two people that said yes to the call of God on their lives. Can you, at your house, with your bowl of checks, can you, we give Pastors Jeremy and Jennifer Foster a huge hand? Come on, for saying yes to the call of God. We love them. We love you guys. Listen, if you missed Vision Sunday at the very beginning of this month, you need to go back and listen to everything God's been doing here at Hope City since 2015. Pastor Jeremy brought a fresh word for where we're going as a church in 21 and beyond. So I want to encourage everybody in this room, I want to encourage you at home, go back to the very first weekend of this month and check it out. If we have not had the privilege of meeting just yet, my name is Daniel Groves. I serve as the teaching pastor here at Hope City. And this week, y'all, we're closing out the final week of 2020. Somebody should shout. That's exciting. We also like to call it the craziest year of our lives. Has it not been a little... Listen, during this pandemic, my wife and I, we, we, had this, we had this saying that we weren't gonna allow this waiting season to be a wasted season. And I remember when Pastor Jeremy, we, he rallied our team and said, listen, we're, we're gonna do whatever it takes to continue to reach people. Y'all here at Hope City, we've taken lemons and turned it into lemonade. Now, some of you are watching, you're like, y'all are selling lemonade now? Like, you have a lemonade truck? Like, you're not, okay, listen. We decided to be even more audacious with our faith in reaching people. We decided to not cower in a corner, but to do whatever it takes to get in the way people storms and show them who the real Jesus is. I wanna give you some snapshot stats of what God has been doing here at Hope City since 2015. Y'all wanna hear them? I need you to get ready at home too. We have served more than two million meals to people in need. That's huge, two million. We provided food, water, and other necessary essential supplies to over 250,000 families. That's incredible. This one right here blesses me because here at Hope City, we not only have a heart for our city, but beyond our walls. We've given over $7 million to local and global missions. That's huge. And this is the one that somebody in the studio is probably gonna run. You may wanna run back and forth in your living room. This is the one that fires us up. The reason we do all of this, over 40,000 people have committed their lives to Jesus since we started Hope City in 2015. Let's go. That's, that's amazing. And listen, we will all unanimously agree though, even with all these amazing moments, we also have had a year of setbacks. None of us are exempt from setbacks. The truth is this has affected thousands of people. I know some of you are watching right now. It's affected your family. It's affected my family. Honestly, it's affected all of our families. Between COVID, racial unrest, economic struggles, school closures, this year has been full of uncertainty. And the truth is no one, and I wish this wasn't true, but nobody gets to live a life without setbacks. All of us will face storms from time to time. And the real issue is this, and I want, I want you to grab this. What's next? How, how do we respond? Do we allow these setbacks to dominate us? Do we stop trying? Do we, do we give up? Do we just throw in the towel? Because listen, if we're not careful, setbacks will lead us towards unhealthy decisions. It'll pull us away from our goals. We'll hear this little voice that says, what's the use in trying? Maybe you've been there. We'll, we'll stop pursuing what God has clearly called us to. We'll pull ourselves back and away from our values. Sometimes after a period of valley moments, our priorities begin to shift. We let go of things that maybe mattered most to us once. We pull away from our purpose. We figure, man, we're doomed anyway, right? We're finished anyway, it's all over. I talked to a girl at a drive through Starbucks and she was like, I just feel like throwing in the towel. It feels like, what's the use anyway? And listen, this is why we've been encouraging our church family I wanna encourage you today, throughout this journey, do not make permanent decisions in a temporary season. Pastor Jeremy said something that's so powerful, and I've been, I've been living, I've been holding on to this through this entire journey. He says, listen, I'm gonna to choose to trust him even when I can't track him. Because listen, we've read the end of the book, y'all, and we win, come on. We may be going through some things right now, we may be going through some trials, but God's faithfulness has never stopped chasing me. Write that down if you're taking down notes. God's faithfulness has never stopped chasing me. That's why this weekend, as we close out 2020, this wild chapter we've all been in and we enter into 21, the title of my sermon, if you're writing down notes, if you're taking down notes at home, is let's talk about hope. Like, let's talk about hope. 
Can I sing that? Oh, can I sing a, can I sing a melody from the salt and the pepper? Is that not allowed? Let's talk about hope. Come on. Let's talk about hope. And I love this acronym of the word hope. It says this, hang on, peace exists. Maybe this year you found yourself pulling back. Maybe this year you've been trying to figure it out on your own. This year, the reality is a lot of people lost their peace. They, they felt hopeless. And I want to encourage you watching right now in this room, if any area of your life has felt hopeless, it's been under the influence of a lie. And I want to take us on a journey this weekend to help us unlock hope again in our lives. They say statistically, people started pulling back more than ever, pulling back from God, pulling back from spending time in his presence, pulling back from prayer, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, panic attacks are at an all-time high. And I'm telling you, it's not time to pull back, y'all. More than ever, we need God. More than ever, I'm saying it again, we need God. We have to lean into his presence more than ever. We say this all the time here at Hope City. If the presence of God is your last resort, change that. It has to become your first priority. I read this sobering verse in Job chapter eight. And when I read it, it just hit me. It says this, those who forget God have no hope. And I feel like so much during all of this pressing and squeezing and craziness we've been going through this year, so many people have just given up on God, said, listen, what's the use? Those without God have no hope. More than ever, we have to cling to the heart of God. More than ever, we have to allow him to unlock real hope inside of us. All right, so I want you to write this down. What is real hope? Well, first, let me clear up the first misconception. Hope is not optimism. Now, optimism is a good thing. Like some of y'all are like, are you telling me not to be optimistic? No, optimism is a good thing. I actually love the definition of the word optimism. It's hopefulness and confidence about the future or the successful outcome of something. Listen, to be optimistic is way better than being a pessimist. Have you ever met that person? Like, well, it's got another case of the Mondays. Well, when it rains, it pours. Cheryl, she says it's allergies. It's probably the Rona. She might as well just sneeze on me. It just doesn't work. Like optimism is a good thing, but listen, it's not hope. It's not something that we can really build our lives upon. I want to look at three types of hope today that all of us filter our lives through at some point. Here's the first one. Write this down. The first one is called wishful hope. Wishful hope. Wishful hope is the kind of hope that when you're driving and you're late for a meeting, you're like, I'm hoping that I get every green light. Come on, how many of y'all have been there before? I'm hoping I get every single green light. I'm hoping that maybe my boss gets caught in traffic and then I beat them there. Or I'm hoping, this actually happened to me on the drive today. I'm hoping that the police officer didn't see that I was driving pretty quick, right? I'm hoping that when he pulled out and he was following me, he's not following me. I'm hoping that if he pulls me over, I don't get a ticket. I mean, can anybody relate to this? That's called wishful hope. The truth is wishing hope doesn't change the outcome. Now, I know some of you right now, you're like, listen, Daniel, I've hit every single green light. I mean, I've had one of those days where it's like every green light turned and you're like, I live in the fog. I live in the favor of God. And that's awesome. And we'll talk about that another time. But right now we're talking about wishful hope. You can't build your life on wishful hope. You know, when you're walking out of the gas station and you're like, hey, baby, my big toes twitch, and I think it's time for the Powerball. Like, <laughs> you know you statistically have a better chance of going to the moon than winning the Powerball? You know statistically you have a better chance of getting struck by lightning than getting hit, or, or than, than winning the, the Powerball. Some of you are like, thank you. This year has already been heavy, and now you're popping my bubble here. <laughs> no, it's wishful hope. Some of you maybe have built your life on this. It's not consistent, and it will never turn out the way you were hoping. Can't build your life upon it. Number two, we filter our lives through this. It's called expectant hope. Now, expectant hope is way better than wishful hope. I mean, if you're living a life that's more of an expectant hope, okay. It's like if I go out to a garden and I decide to plant, say, tomato seeds. I, there's an expectation that because I put it in the ground, there's an expectant hope that when I go back later, I'm going to have some tomatoes, right? right? It's not that I'm going out and staring at the ground and my wife's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm hoping the tomatoes grow. She's like, did you plant anything? I didn't. That's called wishful hope. 
But expectant hope, there's a little bit more faith connected to this. I come from a long line of farmers and my, uh, my family, man, they plant thousands of acres and, and they're watching right now. Can you give my family a hand? They're all watching. They're all wearing their John Deere outfits. Anyways, we plow the dirt, they plant the seeds and there's expectancy. There's expectation that what they're going to do is gonna have a harvest and a follow through. But then there's been summers that were super hot. There's been droughts where there was no rain and they ended up with no crops. It wasn't that they failed to do something or follow through on something. Sometimes, this is heavy, expectant hope just doesn't turn out the way we planned. When a woman is pregnant, they literally say she's expecting. Some of you know my wife and I's story. Sadly, we experienced the pain of a miscarriage between baby number three and, and four. And I remember in that process, I remember walking through that and realizing that sometimes expectant hope just doesn't come to pass. I remember walking through it and wondering what we could have done different. And, and I want to encourage you right now, because I don't want you to take this out of context or think I'm being a Debbie Downer. Don't get me wrong. We don't stop believing. It's not that we give up on faith. We don't stop releasing our faith, but we have to have the right foundation to build hope upon. Sorry, here's the shift. Because there's no guarantee in wishful hope. There's no guarantee even in expectant hope. I don't want you to take a deep breath. Be real careful, but take a deep breath. Don't exhale. You know, we're being careful with the COVID. Take a deep breath at home. There's a shift that's about to happen. The Bible talks about a third type of hope, and this is the one that I want to talk about a little bit more today. It's called certain hope. This is the one that I want to unpack today. Write that down. It's called certain hope. Expectant hope will get you through some seasons. Certain hope will get you through every season. Expectant hope is good. There's some seasons that expectation in God and that God will get you through so that you can keep on standing. It'll happen. But certain hope, I'm telling you, will keep your feet steadfast through the season or the storm or the journey. It will keep and maintain your joy. It will seal your confidence. It will make you feel unshakable because you have an understanding of the truth. See, there's fact and then there's fiction, right? You, you, you know that. There's fact and there's fiction. And when you know the promises of God and you build your hope around it, your hope is settled. Come on, just close your eyes and say, my hope is settled. And this is what the Bible is talking about. It's not talking about wishing, not feeling, not simply just expecting, but knowing for certain that you can build your life upon this foundation of certain hope. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, this is our faith verse. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's certain hope. The evidence of things not seen. Did you realize that faith and hope actually work together? They actually go together? You can't have faith without hope. A lot of people are unaware of this, that hope and faith literally work and go together. Because if there's nothing to hope for, there's nothing to believe for. If you didn't have the hope of heaven, there would be no reason to believe in heaven, right? So hope and faith actually work together. Now, I want to really look at this certain hope. And I want to look at this in the words so you don't just think this is my opinion. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 says this, the certain hope of being saved is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It's a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. With certain hope, there's no doubt. There's no hesitation. There's no reservation. There's no but what ifs. There's no but what if it doesn't work out with certain hope. Certain hope means it's sure, it's confident, it's guaranteed. You can count on it. Say that out loud. Say, I can count on it. The Bible says that this is the kind of foundational hope that we are supposed to build everything upon. Our futures, our legacy, your purpose, it's all tied to certain hope because it's real hope. It's not phony hope. It's not wishing hope or even expecting hope. It's different. This verse shows us that there are three characteristics of certain hope. Three characteristics of certain hope. Number one, write this down, it's strong. Certain hope is strong. That means it's solid, it's sturdy, it's stable, it's unchanging, it's built upon the rock. It's not, it's not weak hope, it's strong hope. Number two, it says that it's trustworthy. The word trustworthy literally means it's dependable. Y'all, certain hope you can rely on. You can count on it. And number three, this is the one that blesses me. It says that it's an anchor. This verse says that hope 
Certain hope is the anchor for your soul. So what's the purpose of an anchor? Why do we need an anchor? You know, it's said that you can go a few weeks without food. Now, during COVID, uh, I was gaining quite a few LBs. Like, I'll be honest. Like, I was snacking a lot. Like, my kids named me the snack attack. I'm like, that's not fair. And my wife's like, why are you snacking so much? I'm like, because I'm trying to gain weight for a movie role. And she was like, what movie? I'm like, I haven't gotten any opportunities yet, but I'm ready in and out of season. Don't rain on my parade. But now, now listen, your boy has been doing way better. I've lost 12 pounds in eight days. Let's go, somebody. And then I know my angles now, so I can, all right, moving on. But you know, they say you can go weeks without food. You can go days without water. You can go minutes without air. Statistically, they say you cannot live a life without hope. But I wanna, I'm gonna look at the, the word anchor here for a moment. So a ship or a boat has an anchor that's connected to it. So, so what's the purpose of an anchor? Some of you know, some of you are like, I don't care, but I need you to lock in. The first purpose is to keep the boat or the ship from drifting. The anchor is super important. The second purpose of an anchor, watch this, is to bring stability in the middle of the storm. These are the very two things, look at this parallel, that we need in our lives. We need an anchor that keeps us from drifting, right? And keeps us stable in the middle of the storms. The Bible actually says that the anchor of your soul is not money, it's not material objects or fame or even influence. The anchor of your soul is certain hope. So again, the anchor's purpose is to keep you from drifting. A ship or a boat, there's this chain that's connected to the anchor, and in the middle of a storm or something that's unsettled, the ship will only move or drift as far as the chain that it's connected to. But without an anchor, a boat or a ship can drift very easily into unsafe waters. Again, look at this parallel. Think about 2020. Think about how wild this year has been. Think about how, if we didn't have an anchor, how easy it was for us to drift off into unsafe waters. And what's really interesting, if you've ever been on a boat, how many of y'all have ever been on a boat? How many of y'all like boats? Some of y'all like, I'm like a cat, I don't like water, it's okay. If you've ever been on a boat, even if the water is still, it's still very easy to drift. Even if the water is completely calm, you're like, why are we drifting? Because there's currents and there's movement that's happening underneath. Uh, we went to lunch, I was preaching in Florida and we went to lunch and, and they were like, hey, you wanna go out on a boat? And I was like, don't threaten me with a good time. Like, I'm ready to go. So I put on my Panama Jack clothes and I was ready to go. And so we're at lunch and they pull up and I don't know what happened because I don't know anything about boats. Uh, he, he, I guess, didn't tie the boat where it needed to, like he didn't tie it off right. So we're eating and we're enjoying And all of a sudden he looks up and the boat has drifted like way off into the canal. He full-blown panics. This guy takes off in a dead sprint with a huge Panama Jack looking hat on and a Hawaiian shirt. I'm just giving you context. And he jumps in, I'm assuming because he's, been around you know, bodies of water in the boat scene for a while, that he's gonna be more graceful. He hit the water so hard, everybody sitting there went, oh, like he just <laughs> slammed into the water and then he frantically is trying to swim, his Hawaiian shirt's over his head and I'm like, that is crazy. And can I get a refill? I just, I, I was watching this and then this guy pulls up in a jet ski like, hey, hey man, I could have just taken you, you out. <laughs> But what, what was crazy was, on that specific day, you could barely feel a wind. Right. It's really easy to drift in life. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever noticed this in your life? Yeah. That it's actually really easy to drift? It's easy to drift if you're not careful away from God. It's, it's easy to drift away from your goals. It's actually really easy to drift away from even the people you love. It's easy to drift away from your dreams. We're constantly drifting if we're not anchored. You can drift, I know this personally in my life, you can drift even if you don't know it. That's why here at Hope City, we believe we're better together. That's why we want you to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, make a difference. That's why we want you to be connected to the local church. That's why we want you to get connected into a connect group. That's why we want you to be a part of the dream team. Join the digital dream team and stay connected. Why? Because it's really easy to drift when you're on your own without an anchor. Right, right. All right, so the other purpose that I mentioned earlier is that the anchor serves a purpose of keeping stability in the middle of a storm. So when a ship or a boat lets down their anchor in the middle of a storm, it keeps the ship or the boat from pitching and rolling really bad. 
Now, maybe some of you have no clue about anchors, and I really looked into this like a moth to a flame. I was drawn in. I was looking at pictures of anchors for hours. Like, I've, I love this. It was quite the ponderment. It was amazing. And ponderment's not a word. Uh, but we were in our connect group, and this guy said ponderment. I'm like, I like that word, and I'm going to start using it, and we're going <laughs> to make it a word. Okay, so the oldest anchors were actually just big rocks. They would bore or drill a hole into it and connect a chain, or they actually would use like massive baskets with like stone or rocks to keep the ship or the boat from drifting or keep it stable. But then they discovered the best design. They discovered the best design had hooks on it. I'm actually going to put a picture up. You're seeing it on the screen right now, right there. So there's, there's, the, there's the hooks. And so there's these kind of gritty, grabbing into the ground sort of hooks, and they realize these are better than just big stones or baskets. Now this next pick, look at this. This is a chain for huge ships. This is crazy. Like each one of those links, they say weigh up to 500 pounds. Like these little dudes walking, they look like Lego characters. Look at these guys. That's crazy. That's just the chain. And then here's the next pick. This is a super large anchor. This specific anchor weighs 36 tons. For those of you who don't know math, a ton is 2,000 pounds. That's a lot of weight, y'all. 36 tons. Look at this lady sitting next to it. It's absolutely huge. Now, some of you are sitting there like, he doesn't know that much about anchors. Listen, if, if you know more about anchors than me, don't at me, okay? Uh, I've been doing a lot of research, but if you do, I, appreci- I would appreciate an email. You can send, you can write my email down. It's kirk at kirkcameron.com. <laughs> Is that bad? Should I? Okay. Kirk's like, why am I getting all these emails about anchors? That last one was 36 tons. You know how hard, how much time it probably takes to lower, put this in. Well, what's the point of that? The bigger the ship or the bigger the boat, the bigger the anchor. And I want you to grab this. The bigger your faith, the bigger your hope, the bigger the anchor that you need. God has not called you to live a life that has small faith. We need a large anchor. We don't need a small anchor. He's called us to live a big life, a life full of purpose and passion. You know, the second half of John 10, 10 literally says he's called to give us a life that's more abundant. Come on, somebody. You're gonna need a big anchor to where God is taking you to. I'm telling you right now, close your eyes. I'm telling you right now, with big vision and big faith, you would not give up now if you knew where God was about to take you. Say this out loud. I'm gonna need a big anchor. Come on, say it out loud. You're gonna need a big anchor. It's 2020, brought a lot of storms. Storms happen in life. 2020 has been a Massive roller coaster of storms and frustrations and troubles. You know, the truth is in the word, Jesus actually told us, listen, you're going to go through some things. He told us we're going to have storms and trials. In John 16, he said this, I've told you these things so that in me, you're going to have peace because in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. When he says, take heart, he's saying, listen, have courage because I've overcome the world. And what he's saying is I've overcome and I've conquered it so you can The truth is, guys, in life, we're all going to unanimously agree that we're going to experience rogue winds. We're going to deal with tidal waves. What seems like in every area of your life, physically, mentally, financially, spiritually, we're all going to go through some things. That's why we have to keep our anchor connected to the right things to keep us from drifting, to keep us stable in the middle of the storms. So write this down. Where do you get this anchor? This is a loaded question. Where do I get this type of anchor? Because again, statistically, people in a season of pressing either pull back from God or press into God. We we talk about it like this. A lot of times when you're squeezed, it's almost like the glass box on the wall that says break in case of emergency. That's when people begin to look to God. When people are in a place of deep pain or despair, and maybe you can relate to this, a long time ago, in my family, because my dad's been serving the Lord now over 30 years, but a long time ago when my dad was broken and in a deep place of despair and pain, he found his anchor connected to the bottom of a bottle. Maybe it's drugs or prescription drug issues. Maybe your anchor's tied to food or toxic behaviors or even toxic relationship. Let me ask you this. What's your anchor tied to? Maybe it's this, well, if I could just have the perfect vacation, I'd have peace. If I could just find that perfect job, I know everything would be okay. If I just had that perfect relationship to anchor my life to, I would have it all figured out. It could be good or bad. Here's the truth. All of us are looking for something to anchor our lives to. And our anchor really has to be connected 
to one person, and his name is Jesus. He's the only certain hope. So again, not wishful hope, not even expectant hope, but a strong, trustworthy anchor for our souls. Write this down if you take down notes. Real hope is based on God's word. Real hope is based on God's word. It's not based upon what I sense. It's based upon what he has said. It's not based upon my emotions. It's based upon what God has spoken. Come on. It's not based upon my imagination. It's based upon his obligation to do what he says in his word. You know that there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible to you? Y'all, that's a lot. It's not like there's a baker's dozen. I hope you get one. Over 7,000? And here's the truth. Over and over and over in the Bible, it says this, that God cannot lie. Certain hope is based on the fact that God cannot lie. The Bible's super clear that the devil is a liar. Can we all agree? It's also super clear that all truth comes from God. That's why it's super important, again, for us to recognize that these 7,000 promises belong to you. Say they belong to me. Come on. Certain hope is based on the fact that God will never lie. Write this down. This fires me up. Certain hope is also based on the promises of God. See, when you cling to the promises, you'll base your life around God's word, not your wishes. Now, I think this is a loaded question sometimes. Well, how come I haven't seen God's promises working all the time in my life? I've asked those questions. I came to this place. I've talked to Bible theologians. I'm not a Bible theologian, but I have a lot of friends that are, and God has eternity to follow through on his promises. When he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, in our humanity, we think only in terms here on this earth. But God is saying, listen, I'm like a daddy to a daughter. I'm like a father to a son for all of eternity. God, unlike us, is not limited by space and time, right? So when he says, my promises are yes and amen, he's thinking about now. He's also thinking about forever. You can write this down. We've been saying this all year and we've needed it as an anthem that God's promises don't have expiration dates on them. And again, we don't base this upon what we feel. We base it upon what God reveals, not our wishes, but his word. So let's look again at his word for a moment. Jesus says this in Luke 18. He said, then Jesus, talking about the word, talking about being in his presence, Jesus taught the followers that they should always pray and never lose hope. He's talking about certain hope. Write that down if you're taking down notes. Always pray and never lose hope. These are the two alternatives that we have in life. These are the two alternatives. Each time we're squeezed, each time that we're dealing with deep pain, we can either panic or we can pray. You'll either worship or you're gonna worry. And that's why we encourage our church to do the first 15 challenge every day. Take the first five minutes in prayer, first five minutes in the word, first five minutes in worship every day. Why? To get filled up with more of God every day so that you'll overflow with more of God every day. John chapter three, verse 30 says, Lord, become greater and greater in my life. Increase in my life as I decrease and get out of the way. We're talking about filled up. Say, I'm getting filled up. Come on. In Colossians 1, 27, again, staying filled up. It says this. It says that Christ in you is the hope of glory. This is certain hope. We're talking about this for a minute. For many years, I kind of missed this truth. Like, I, I knew Christ was, was with me, right? I, I knew Christ was around me. I knew Christ was ahead of me, and I knew Christ was for me, but I never really grasped Christ in me. And honestly, I can't blame the Scripture on this because Paul actually refers to the indwelling of Christ 216 times. John mentions his presence 26 times. There was a season in my life where I treated, and maybe you can relate, I treated the presence of God like a painkiller, almost like an ibuprofen to a headache. The truth is Christ in you, the hope of glory, wants to heal your entire life. He wants to give you a certain hope that you can build everything upon. Can I get an amen? Come on. All right, we're bringing this in for a landing, and I want to give you four anchors to secure your life to for certain hope, okay? So write that down, four anchors to secure my life to for certain hope. Number one, we have to have the anchor of God's presence. We have to get into his presence. This has to be a priority going into 21. First Chronicles 16, 11 says this, seek the Lord and his strength, seek his presence continually. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. There was this statistic that said the last 10 years, the thing that's been in decline 
And Christianity has been passion and compassion. I know I say that a little bit funny. Some of y'all are like, did you say fashion? No, passion <laughs> and compassion. They say that this thing has been in steady decline. See, at Hope City, I don't think that's true. I think we're passionate people that long to be in the presence of God. I think we're compassionate people that want to see people set free, healed, and delivered. So more than ever, we have to spend time in his presence. So that's the first anchor, the anchor of God's presence. Number two, we have to secure our life to the anchor of God's promise. Deuteronomy 31.8 says it this way, the Lord himself, that, that fires me up. It's not like, and the Lord sent somebody. No, it says the Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. And then it says this, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That's a promise that we can build our lives on. Matthew 11, verse 28, 29 says this, come to me, this is another promise, all who are weary and burdened, and watch this, I will give you rest. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This certain hope, there's a rest for your soul. There's a rest for your heart. There's a rest for your mind. There's a rest for your entire life when you secure your anchor to God's promises. And this is one of my favorite promises in the Bible. Romans chapter eight, verse 38. Write that reference down. Romans eight, verse 38 and 39. It says this, for I am convinced. Well, I love that start. That makes me want to run around the room. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to, watch this, separate us. This is a promise from the love of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, I'm fired up. We have to secure our lives to his promise. Number three, you have to secure your anchor to God's power. Now, I'm going to read this whole this whole. Uh, passage because I just, I love the way this reads. I love this story. I love how the disciples were like, boom, ba -doo, ba -doo. they were like fumbling <laughs> through this moment, how just laid back and low key Jesus was. Matthew 4, verse 35 through 41. It'll be on the screen. It says, on the evening of the same day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go across to the other side of the lake. We're talking about securing your life to his power. Verse 36, so they left the crowd. The disciples got into the boat, which Jesus was already sitting and they took him with them. There was other boats there too. Verse 37, suddenly a strong wind blew up and the waves began to spill over into the boat so that everything in the boat began to fill up and it began to fill up with water. Verse 38, Jesus was back in the back of the boat, sleeping with his head on a my pillow. My, in the my pillow. It's the best night's sleep ever. So, so right, he's sleeping on my pillow. My wife has one of those my pillows, and she'll be like, You sleeping on my pillow? I was like, This is my pillow. And she's like, Stop touching my pillow. We're talking about my pillow. We're talking about the my pillow. Best nights. All right, so Jesus is sleeping. Has anybody ever seen the my? Jesus is sleeping on the my pillow. Just Google it. Okay, the disciples woke up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're about to die? Like these disciples, man, these guys, sometimes I'm like, Some dishonor in the camp. Jesus stood up and commanded the wind. He said this, be quiet. I love Jesus' boldness. And he said to the waves, be still. And it says the wind began to die down and there was a great calm. Verse 40, Jesus said to his disciples, what are you frightened of? Do you still have no faith? Verse 41, but then they were terribly afraid and began to say to one another, who is this man? Even the winds and the waves obey him. I want you to look at me. Only the power of God is strong enough to be your anchor in the middle of a storm. Yeah. Nothing else and no one else can be strong enough. In a storm, even the winds in the waves listen to him. Isaiah 26, 4 says it this way, Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. You have to trust him, not what your bank account says. You have to trust him, not what the diagnosis was. You have to trust him, even though that marriage seems like it's falling apart, I believe with faith and certain hope it's gonna fall into place. You have to trust him that he can and will deliver from addictions and strongholds and struggles. I'm telling you, we have to stop talking about how big our storm is and start talking about how big our God is. Come on, when we secure our life to the anchor of God's power, everything changes. The last one, number four, we have to secure our anchor to God's peace. 
Romans 15 verse 13 says it this way. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope. That's that certain hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Psalms 23 verse four says this. It's a little, little bit uh, paraphrased. Even though I walked through the darkest valley in 2020, I will not, people are like, that's in the Bible? Like, even though I walked through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Why? Because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. My favorite final verse is we land our fourth anchor we're securing our lives to, securing our lives to the anchor of peace. The last verse, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. Now may the Lord of peace himself, again, that's, it's Jesus. It's the power of his spirit fighting for you. May the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times, every situation. May the Lord be with you all. Here's the truth. We need to be optimistic. And put on a smile, even when you don't feel like it. Come on, take off that heaviness. Take off the heaviness of 2020 and replace it with an Isaiah 61.3 garment of praise. We need to be optimistic. Come on, we need to speak life. Proverbs 18.21 says that life and death's in the power of your tongue. Speak life. I'm going to have the best year ever. Come on, speak life. It's going to be a blessed year. I'm going to be able to bless others. Come on, it's going to be a year of health and strength. Optimism is a big deal. We need it going into our new chapter, into our new season. Because I really believe that the rest of our days are the best of our days. Like, that's what we just keep saying around our house. My four-year-old, she's like, rest of our days are the best of our days. That's, that's, that's what we believe. Again, optimism is important, but I want to challenge you throughout this entire journey we've been on this weekend to make sure that you're not just building your life on optimism, on wishful hope, on even expectant hope, we have to build our lives on the foundation of Jesus, our certain hope. Come on, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your goodness, your mercy. Thank you for your grace. God, right now there are people that are watching that are going through pain. They're going through despair. They're going through broken moments. God, I pray today that certain hope would be unlocked in their life, that they would begin to lean in your presence more than ever, that they would lay down heaviness, they would lay down burdens, they would lay down brokenness, and they would cling to your promises in your heart. God, let them secure their lives to your presence. Let them secure their anchor to your promises. Let them secure their anchor to your power. And let them secure their anchors to your peace. As we lay down all these things and we step into a new season, not dragging the residue of where we've been, but stepping into a brand new year, confident with certain hope that you are for us and not against us. Now, right now, look at me. If you're here watching this weekend, maybe you were flipping through the news feed and you just stumbled upon us on social media. Maybe you were intentional and you came here today, but maybe you're here and you said, Daniel, here's the truth. I don't have certain hope because I don't know Jesus. And the reality is certain hope is completely, and totally built on the foundation of Jesus. So if you're here right now and you're like, I, I just don't know him like you guys are talking about. Something in my heart has convinced me of the fact all service long that there's more to life than the way I've been living it. And today's the day that I want to surrender everything to Jesus. See, at Hope City, we don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons. We go along with the verses in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 that say this, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And watch this, you'll be saved. You'll receive that grace that you didn't deserve and that certain hope. Maybe you're watching right now and you got caught up in the prodigal life and you've fallen away from God. You say, today, I want to rededicate my life. We're all going to pray in this room. I want you to pray. Put your bowl of lucky charms down and just pray. Stand at your feet if you want. If you're about to give your life to Jesus, I want you to type, yes, you can type, I just gave my life to the Lord. And our host at the end, Ben, is going to give you some more direction on your next steps. But I want everybody to pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it hasn't worked. From today on, I choose to live for you. I surrender everything, every mistake, every sin, every struggle, I lay it at your feet. From this moment on, I will not drag the residue of who I used to be and to who I've become. I confess you as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can somebody give God praise in this room?
All right, lift your hands, lift your hands. I'm gonna speak a blessing over you the final week of 2020. This is a verse, the benediction, the greatest blessing in the word. Pastor Jeremy always closes it. We close it this way every time in our live services. May the Lord bless you. Numbers chapter six, verse 24 through 26. May he keep you. Make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he turn his body language, his attention, his countenance towards you. And as we close out one chapter and we enter a new one, may he give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.